Have you heard? Metro by T-Mobile now includes Amazon Prime. Yes, enjoy the best of shopping and entertainment, movies, TV shows, music, free shipping, and much more. All included for just $40 per line for three lines. All on the T-Mobile network. Discover the smarter way. Metro by T-Mobile. That's genius. One offer per account. Offer subject to change. $12.99 per month value. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Metro customers may notice reduced speeds versus some T-Mobile customers. Video at 480p. Capable device required. See store for details and terms and conditions. with my co-host Karen Christine Patrick and today we're going to interview Walter Crittenden. Crittenden. I'm sorry I probably crucified that word but I'll have Walter pronounce it. He is a speaker at the upcoming conference called Contact in the Desert and this is the Aquarium Radio Network and I'm going to have Karen, oh, I think I've got her on mute, no here we go. Aloha, oh, don't put me on mute. Like, no, no, don't put you on mute. Uh, would you like to read the bio for Walter, and then we'll bring on Walter. Yes, I'd be glad. Walter Cuttenden <laughs> is the director of the Binary Research Institute in Newport Beach, California, beautiful part of the country, where he explores the cause and consequences of solar system motion. This is the focus of his book, Lost Star of Myth and Time, and the documentary, The Great Year, Narrated by James Earl Jones. I, I looked that up today. I'm going to be ordering it. It sounds wonderful. Walter's wonderful. new children. Oh yeah, it's great. Walter's new children's book, The Great Year Adventure with Tommy the Time Traveling Turtle, which sounds adorable, describes the Great Year in a way that even grown-ups can understand. Cottenden is also the host of the popular podcast series, The Cosmic Influence on. And that, you can find that on iTunes. And there's an annual conference on procession and ancient knowledge, uh, CPAC. And I hope he tells us more about that. It sounds wonderful, as well as Contact in the Desert. And uh, these, um, this particular conference uh, brings together authors and scientists from around the world discussing the implications of the great procession cycle on archaeology, anthropology, consciousness, history, and Mother Earth herself. Walter's passion is to bring back an awareness of the cycle of the ages and its important lesson for mankind in the present era. Back to you, Janet. Welcome, Walter, to the show. Thank you for coming to Aquarian Radio today. Well, thank you, girls. Karen, thanks for that nice intro. It's a pleasure to be here. We're excited to have you. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your books, your research. We're very excited to hear about your theory and understanding of the cosmos. Yes, yes. I'm I'm just uh, a curious person, and so I've uh, been looking at solar system uh, science, you know, really since I was a boy. And um, as you probably know, there's a lot of, interesting news, uh, particularly lately, um, about uh, the possibility of a ninth planet that's been talked about. And um, I think that's an assumption that it's a planet. It's uh, what we do know is that there's some sort of gravitational tug on our solar system. And so um, really just looking into the general solar system science and um, it's led to a number of, you know, observations about some uh, some problems that have occurred over the years. For example, uh, the precession problem. Uh, it's it now takes about you know four thousand inputs just to f- figure out uh, the precession equation. 
um, and uh, anomalous acceleration of some of the spacecraft, things like that. And so, but the real practical application is uh, has to do with um, ancient cultures to some degree, and that is, you probably know that um, ancient cultures around the world spoke of this uh, cycle of time with alternating dark and golden ages. Mm-hmm, and so right. the the premise here, and in, in, in just a quick summary, is just as the Earth spins on its axis and gives you the cycle of day and night, which kind of causes us to go from subconscious to conscious and back and forth. And so we actually change consciousness, but it's so routine we hardly even remark at it anymore. And then just as the second motion of the Earth, the Earth revolving around the sun causes the cycle of the season, and that causes you know, billions of plants and animals to change or migrate or spawn or, uh, you know, dramatically shift the, the the look and feel of the earth with the seasons. Uh, so too, uh, does there appear to be a third celestial motion, which is not just the earth spinning, not just the earth revolving around the sun, but the whole solar system uh, moving through space. And as it goes closer to and farther from uh, you know, another star, uh, then it seems to have the same effect, but it's over much longer periods of time. And so this has just been a part of myth and folklore for, for many, many years. And um, my sort of role in this thing is to uh, see if there's some science to sort of underlie this, uh, this idea of a long lost golden age and a cycle of the ages. And indeed, it appears that there's a lot of science to support it. And that's where we are now. Wow, fascinating. So I, I have a couple of questions. I know Karen's got her hands up. I can see her even across the, the galaxy here. <laughs> um, I'm a, an Anunnaki ancient aliens researcher and an experiencer, and my husband and I have written several books on the Anunnaki. And, of course, you know, Planet X, Nibiru, and Nemesis, and Sekirai Sitchin information, and they, too, uh, in that series book talks about, um, you know, I, Enki would take Mars book up to the moon and they would, you know, where they had a better vision, they were trying to determine the, you know, the procession of the equinox. When when were, was the Vero coming through? When were they changing constellations? Who, and based on that, they would change who would rule on the earth here. So that's how that affected each other. And uh, I like your analogy, how, we have our own night and day cycle, conscious, unconscious. And so that correlates, I guess, with the um, uh, the Sanskrit uh, yogic type practice of um, the yugas. And that's what you're talking about, the yugas. And we talk about, I'm also a tantra, master tantra teacher. We talk about the chakras and the yugas and the cycles in our uh, Indian type knowledge. So I just wanted to comment yeah, on that. Yes. Karen, what did you want to say? Or what do you want to say about that, Walter, what I just said? Go ahead. Well, just, just to comment briefly. So this cycle of the ages was uh, known to uh, at least 30 ancient cultures. And we find this from uh, the book called Hamlet's Mill, written by Giorgio de Santiana, the former professor of the history of science at MIT. And so he tells us that uh, many ancient cultures talked about this cycle. And you're right, the in the Indian culture, ancient Indian culture, they called it the Yuga cycle, uh, where we go through the Kali Dwapara, Treta, and Satya Yugas. And that's the equivalent of the the way the Greeks uh, call the Iron, Bronze, Silver, and Golden Age. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it seems to be a rather ancient uh, universal belief uh, that was forgotten during the Dark Ages. So are we coming into an age of light? Let's say Korean well, Age, does... Golden Age? Yes, I mean... Um... You know, since the uh, uh, since the, the sort of the depths of the dark ages, you know, call it a thousand years ago. Essentially, every every country is at war with one another. Uh, our lifespan is half of what it is now. Uh, there's no justice whatsoever. There's plagues that ravage the earth. I mean, it's a pretty dark and dreary place during the dark ages. And then the Renaissance, uh, you know, that means rebirth. Obviously, there was an acceleration in knowledge, and we discover magnetism, electricity, you know, 
all sorts of uh, new sciences, if you will. And, and, um, and since then, that time, the, the world is definitely progressing. It's, it's still uh, far, far from perfect by any means, but uh, it does appear that, you know, man's uh, learning more and more about the world around him and, and the universe around him, indeed. Karen. Well, I'm so glad you talked about the Dark Ages because the first question I thought that I really wanted to ask you and, you know, get it on the record because uh, I have a group called the Earth Anomaly Research Society on Facebook and we just look at every kind of, you know, anomaly, uh, crop circles, sinkholes, volcanoes, pyramids, um, you know, and, and, you know, cycles of the Earth in ancient history and I've had people come in who believe something that was very readily believed during the Dark Ages. Uh, it's not my personal belief, but I want to get your statement on it. People who believe in the flat earth theory. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that popped out from the Dark Ages. I thought we were done with that one. But there's definitely people who, you know, for that possibly lack of knowledge, suspicion of our space agency, um, you know, having this feeling they were, weren't being told the truth about the cosmos but kind of went into an interesting rabbit hole direction. Do you have any ways, because, you know, I've read some of your material today, and, yeah, you, you, you got into the details. Oh, what, and one of the things, right. when I was a kid, I was an astronomy nut, and that was one thing I never believed was the wobble theory of the procession. That just didn't sit well with me, but I didn't, you know, have the knowledge to know what you bring out, and if you could talk about, you know, kind of segue into that, that'd be great. Sure. Well, you know, on the flat earth thing, I mean, there's a lot of skeptical people out there, but I think that's being a little too skeptical in that you can just simply sit on the horizon and watch a boat uh, slowly come over it, uh, you know, and first you just see its mast, and then you see more of it, then you see the ship, and I mean, it's pretty obvious <laughs> that the world is is around and it's been proven in about a zillion ways. So uh, enough of that topic. Uh, you <laughs> I know, agree. It, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> as, yeah. As far as procession. So it's um, uh, Copernicus is the one that, you know, sort of the, in the midst of the Renaissance, uh, he, um, he sort of re re define the solar system, if you will, and the way the earth moves. And so uh, Ptolemy, uh, of course, had this um, earth-centric uh, point of view. And, um, and uh, of course, Copernicus said, no, 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 the sun's at the center of the solar system and came out with the heliocentric system and, and gave us a lot of uh, logical reasons for it. And so he he very clearly explained the Earth's rotation on its axis, the first motion the Earth, he called it, and the second motion uh, called revolution. And this is in his book, De, De Revolute Onibus. And, uh, and the third motion he called libration, uh, which uh, we know as procession. And I think it was called procession because instead of, uh, you know, the, the sun moving uh, sort of, through the signs on a on a yearly basis in one direction, it goes in the opposite direction. If you look at it just once a year, say say on the equinox, thus the term procession, the equinox, um, four thousand years ago, you know, if you looked at what constellation the sun was in, you would have seen that it was in Aries, and then two thousand years ago, up just about to the present, it's been in uh, Pisces, and that's using the vernal equinox, uh, the spring equinox. And then, uh, of course, it's now about to go into Aquarius. It, it only moves about 50 arc seconds per year, so it takes 72 years to move a degree. Um, and so that's the reason for the term, the dawning of the age of Aquarius, you know, people talking about uh, procession. And so uh, it's true that it's a very observable thing and Newton tried to explain it. Copernicus never could. 
And Newton said, well, it must be due to the gravitation of the sun and the moon tugging on the earth, wobbling a little bit. And, um, but his equations didn't work. And so ever since that time, and it's been hundreds of years, you know, uh, especially recently, like every 10 years, they changed the precession equations trying to explain how the nearby gravitational bodies could bobble the earth in a way to create the precession observable. And it's, it doesn't work very well. It, it, as I mentioned earlier, it takes a lot of inputs. And so a much simpler way to explain why we see the sun moving through different constellations is because the sun actually moves. Uh, Copernicus couldn't raise this as a, uh, you know, as a hypothesis at the time, because he had just established that the sun was the center of the solar system. So that then to have the sun go move would have been too much to ask. But of course, scientists today know that the sun and all stars do indeed move. Uh, you know, about 80% of all stars are in binary systems or multiple star systems. You know, they like partners just as much as people do. And so um, it appears that uh, a more logical way to explain uh, the precession observable, the sun moving through different constellations, is that indeed the solar system is moving. And, and in fact, we've written papers that one can find on the Binary Research Institute website uh, that show you can predict the, the change in the rate of precession uh, approximately 40 times more accurately just using Kepler's laws, which is you know, just basic uh, science of bodies in motion uh, that show that they go in elliptical orbits, uh, that works much better than the what's called the loony solar precession theory, which is the sun and the earth wobbling, or the sun and the moon wobbling the earth. And let me just say real quick on that point that uh, I'm not saying that the earth's not wobbled at all. Uh, because there is something called mutation, which was discovered long after Copernicus and long after Newton, and uh, that is indeed caused by the moon. But it's only uh, a very small amount, and it's an 18-year cycle. It's it's not a 20,000-year-plus cycle uh, that that it takes for the sun to actually go through all 12 of the the constellations, which are simply marker points in space for us. So I hope that's not uh, too uh, boring an explanation. No, but, uh, not at all. I, I'm no, agreeing no, with you. No, no. Yes, okay, thank has you. A, yeah, a good reason, <laughs> a good scientific theory behind it, besides uh, just local gravitational effects. So, so we're not in a wobbling top. <laughs> wobbling. Thanks. So so our, our system is probably a binary system. Solaris um, has a twin, and... Uh, we some call it Nemesis. I'm not sure what her her name would be. I would think uh, it's masculine and feminine usually. So um, Solaris being the masculine, it might be, <laughs> you know, who knows what the, the real name is. It's been kind of hidden in antiquity in the in the myths, right? Is that what your research is showing that somehow they took our binary and made it a myth when it really is true that like most solar systems binary? And do you know? Uh, when that happened and why that was put into myth, when it's really a fact. Okay, so the the myths uh, make reference to you know a very bright uh, star that uh, has some relationship. I mean, this goes back to uh, uh, Sumerian text and and the name for the brightest star. So I'm going to disagree with a lot of those people that call. Them Nibiru, another planet, because I'm, I'm more sort of in the scholar camp that it actually, the, the, the best definition for it is, is bright object or bright star. And so uh, I think it is, uh, there's some reference to it there, but also the, most of the references are sort of to the rising and falling ages. And, you know, it's not always complicated myths. It's as simple as the Greek myths like Hesiod, you know, talked about long, long, uh, higher age, golden age, things like this. And so there's a lot of uh, references to it. And I think, you know, no, nobody really knew the cause of it. So that's why it's assumed to be 
myth to this day. I mean, science considers uh, any talk of a higher, long lost higher age to be myth. But, you know, if you really look carefully at the archaeological record, you find that before the Dark Ages, there were some pretty advanced civilizations. And, you know, ancient Egypt seemed to be at its height very near the beginning. And then it declines to where, you know, they can't even build anything anymore and they're nomadic tribes. Uh, same thing with Sumer, Akkad, Babylon, you know, very sophisticated cities, knowledge of mathematics, knowledge of astronomy, uh, uh, s- underground sewer systems that, uh, you know, they even use some of the remnants of those today. Um, and then, of course, by the time of the Dark Ages, that whole region was nothing but uh, nomadic tribes again. And same thing in in India and, in, um, you know, on the west coast of India there, you find evidence of very advanced uh, civilizations and then they go to basically go to dust. Uh, and so it's, it seems fairly obvious that there's, uh, you know, there were higher cultures. They declined into a dark age. We seem to be uh, advancing again, you know, the last few hundred years, especially. And I think it has a cause beyond simply evolution. You know, if it was straight evolution then and why did so much go so wrong for so long? And uh, and, and in fact, the ancient uh, Babylonians, uh, you look at a scholar like Stefan Mall, uh, you know, look at his Stanford papers. He gave uh, talks at, there at Stanford, his presidential papers, and you will see that he's probably one of the most knowledgeable guys on reading um Sumerian tablets and he talks about how they're aware that they're in a cycle that they're in a declining age and they pretty much predict uh, exactly what happens to their their culture so but but you're right a knowledge of the cycle does get lost in the dark ages and now we're just at the point where pretty good scientists pretty good mathematicians have pretty good telescopes and we're discovering things and the neatest discovery, I think, in space sciences in the last 12 months or so is the one by Caltech. Mm-hmm. Um, Mike Brown, the, you know, who's credited with killing Pluto because he's found so many uh, dwarf planets. Uh, he and uh, some fellow astrophysicists have come out and said there is definitely something big that's tugging on our solar system. And... Uh, so they're trying to find out what it is. And their first hypothesis is a ninth planet. But, you know, every other time we've hypothesized that there's another planet out there, uh, when, uh, which was done with Neptune and, and Uranus, uh, and that, of course, led to Pluto. All these things were found fairly quickly. And this one, you know, they've been talking about it for a couple of years. They've definitely agreed on it for about a year. And yet no planet has been found with all our modern instruments. And so, yes, our, well, our then, belief here at the Binary yeah. Research Institute is that it's, uh, it's another star. So my question being, if it's another star, wouldn't it be another group of planets around the star? Like we have all planets, we have eight or nine or whatever we have around our, our star, so that that's whole uh, system would be a binary system and our solar system would be more complex with not just nine or ten planets it would be you know 20 to 30 or whatever planets around the two different stars and couldn't the star be uh, a whole whole system be kind of cloaked I know uh, Harrington saw something coming in from South Pole he was headed there and he had talked to Sitchin and then he got uh, cancer, like fast, uh, fast acting cancer. He was dead in two days, something strange like that. So there's obviously some kind of faction that doesn't want this out, even in modern ages, with all our research. Um, and like back to the, you know, the dark ages and before, something's been going on there. But we keep seeing that there's some kind of effect. And I wonder, can it be cloaked? Um, you know. We need to think outside of the box. If there is something definitely 
having an effect. We keep looking for it. Right. Yeah, right? there is something. Well, there is something having an effect. <laughs> All the major scientists agree on that, and they assume that it's a planet, and um, but they haven't found a planet. And so, to go to your first question, uh, could it be another star that itself has planets? Possibly. Um, you know, we have discovered now over a thousand exoplanets. These are planets around other stars, and while telescopes haven't actually seen them because uh, you know they're very distant and distant but they they're reliably detected by the change in light coming from other stars so we know that a lot of planet a lot of star systems have planets um, but uh, I don't know if you know we think the best hypothesis is uh, serious because it's you know, sort of the biggest dent in local space. And while it's true, it's not as close as Alpha Centauri. It's uh, much closer to our plane. It's uh, it's three solar masses, so it's heavier than Alpha Centauri. And it's the closest star that has a white dwarf going around it. Um, and so it, we believe that, you know, might create some sort of a gravity well. And, and that's speculation, but it, the tug on our solar system seems to be coming from that direction. It's from the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And, and the way they know that of course is, uh, the, how the, all these dwarf planets that have been found uh, sort of their, how they're uh, sort of displayed out, you know, they're, they're in these very non-random positions. And uh, that's always, you know, a signature of some gravitational effect. And so it's it's really exciting. You know, at the same time that this discovery was made that something is tugging on our solar system, only a few months later, um, Einstein's uh, theory of gravity waves was finally proven. And you probably read about that in the news a couple of months ago. Um, but, he, you know, he theorized this over 100 years ago in 1915, and they finally uh, they built detectors and finally detected something uh, just early this year. And so it's believed now that these gravity waves are generated by uh, binary systems. Uh, the ones that were actually detected are supposedly by binary black holes, you know, two very dense stars. But it was much farther away, so it, it could well be that... Um, you know, stars that are less dense, that are closer by, also produce uh, gravity waves, but that the effect is going to be far more gradual uh, than, you know, two black holes colliding, uh, which is w what they think they detected uh, from the first gravity wave experiment. Karen. Okay, you kind of were getting into it then. Um, I just want to say I have construction at my house. Yeah, right so if back. you hear some right knocks back. and bangs, that yeah, no, this is great. Um, so what is it? I guess that's the big question. Is it a black hole? Is it a brown dwarf? Is it, you know, what is that to your best guess or estimate or what's been discovered? Okay, so that's that's a great line of uh, thinking. So if there's something tugging on our solar system, what is it? And that's kind of what I deal with in my book, uh, Lost Star of Myth and Time. And so we, we do look at the various categories. And I think the first uh, area that people were looking was for was a brown dwarf because they're, you know, harder to see. And because uh, if it was much bigger, people figured, oh, we would have seen it by now. And then there's a few people that think, oh, it could be a red dwarf, which is bigger than a brown dwarf. Uh, if it was towards the galactic center and, and therefore, you know, it's the, the light is kind of lost in, in a, a very dense background of radiation. Um, but those two are sort of the, you know, the, the dark star or hard to find star category. And I think enough looking has been happening there enough searching that uh, it's suspicious that nothing's been found. Um, and then, so the other camp, of course, would be uh, a visible star. 
and then you know logically you'd look at the closest stars to us and um you know bernard star is very close it's it's moving at a very rapid rate uh so it's a potential candidate um most people go straight again to alpha centauri because it's the closest but uh as mentioned uh it doesn't seem to be aligned in a way that could could account yeah. for how our planets are are displayed and so again i lean towards uh sirius because it is uh two solar masses plus the sirius b uh is another solar mass so it's three total solar masses and if gravity waves are caused by you know one star uh or by binary systems then you would affect have some of that type of action going on. And so here's a real simple analogy. Think of a storm way out at sea, you know, thousands of miles away. And and I'm sure you know plenty of surfers there in Maui. And so they Mm -hmm. plot these storms to see how the waves will come in and affect. and, uh, And, you know, if they're big enough storms, they actually will reshape the bottoms and affect the coastline a little bit. And that's exactly what I think is happening uh, with with a serious system. It's, you know, one really dense white dwarf. It, it weighs about two tons per tablespoonful uh, circling Sirius A and creating this storm. But it's been going on for, you know, hundreds of millions of years. And so it has not so much shaped our coastline, but shaped the the uh, distribution of the minor planets in our system so that all the perihelions are aligned uh, fairly close. And um, there seems to be quite a number of these minor objects that are inclined to the plane of the solar system, you know, versus all the regular planets are pretty much on the same plane within a degree or two. And so uh, that is, that would be the longer term effect of gravity waves. And so we're seeing the signature, but we don't quite understand the cause because the science is so new. Okay, and that's sort so, of part, part, part a, I might add that, oh, okay. you know, so if there is another object affecting us uh, and it's rearranging our planets, does it have any other effects? And that's, you know, I, I'm the first to admit we're getting, a little farther out in a hypothesis, but uh, this is what Swami Sri Yukteswar talked about in his book, uh, The Holy Science. And and I do read a lot of the Eastern teachings because they seem to be pretty knowledgeable on this topic. And, you know, he wrote in his book in 1894, long before binary systems were thought to be very prevalent, uh, he wrote that they were a common occurrence and um, and he postulated that this rise and fall of civilization is caused by it. And so um, I, I do think that there's good evidence that there is this other object that's affecting our solar system and that its effects go beyond just rearranging our planet. It actually has an effect like the, the day and night uh, cycle or the season cycle, but it takes place on a much, much larger scale. Okay, that's great. So I guess you kind of answered my next thought, which was the science is new. So I, that I was thinking, is this going to be a discoverable item? Like you said, one aspect, one candidate for doing this is in a radiation uh, area. So uh, as this science develops, do you think it's going to be a discoverable phenomenon? Because it's going to be that aha moment when it fits the math, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, again, I I think it's, you know, so the these aha moments, uh, it's a sort of a, a peeling of the onion, you know, or taking away the veils. And so the, the first thing, you know, you realize is, oh, our solar system's moving. Oh, something's tugging on it because uh, it's rearranged all these planets. Oh, you, you know, we assume it's a ninth planet, but we don't find one. 
Uh, therefore, what else could there be out there? Oh, we discover gravity waves. And so I think it's a whole series of uh, uh, sort of realizations that take place, and they have to fit together, uh, you know, logically and scientifically, obviously, for it to be accepted. And, but I think we're still, you know, a few years from that that point. But I, my bottom line is I believe that, you know, we'll find that our solar system is in a binary system being affected by another star, like many, many other uh, stars are. So we're not so unusual anymore being a single star. Is okay, our thank you. solar system part of a, a galaxy that is perhaps, um, you know, the galaxies are kind of joined to two galaxies rotating around each other and maybe two universes? Does it, does it go on exponentially, larger and larger? That's a great question. Uh, you know, clearly we're finding out that uh, space is a lot more complex than we originally thought. You know, you kind of go from the dark age thought that, hey, it's just the Earth in the middle and, and nothing else out there exists. And then uh, even, you know, 15 years ago, other planets where it was a mere speculation until Jeff Marcy and his team at, at Berkeley, uh, you know, the, the planet hunters really started finding some of these and so did the Spanish team. Um, and then, um, you know, even before that, we were discovering that many, many stars are gravitationally bound to each other in binary or trinary or multiple star systems. And it appears that there's like, um, uh, you know, a lot of little worlds in space. Uh, uh, it's it's not just everything going neatly around in a circle, you know. Just as we've discovered our own solar system, the farther out you go, there's a lot of weird things happening with uh, planets, uh, planetary orbits that are highly inclined to the plane. Um, so too, does it appear that uh, there's other places within our our galaxy for example the great attractor uh, nobody knows what it is but a lot of objects within our galaxy seem to be moving towards it and so um, these are things that are still to be discovered and i believe it's it's a fascinating story to learn that you know things are so beautifully uh, complex and and who knows about other galaxies? I mean, we, we just, they're too far away with our present uh, technology to find out much. But we have found out that there's an awful lot of them. You know, the the mm-hmm. Hubble uh, telescope taught us that. I, I saw one picture where you're looking at such a small amount of the sky. It's the amount of sky you would see if you held a straw up to your eye and that straw was 10 feet long. So you're just looking at this tiny, tiny speck of space. And they kept the uh, Hubble telescope focused on that for a long period of time. And, you know, slowly they pick up photons, more and more photons, and it creates this picture. And uh, they found 10,000 galaxies just within that tiny, tiny bit of space. And so it's... The universe is just so vast, we we can't even conceive of it. I was watching a movie that won the um, IUFO Congress Award, I think in 2013, and um, something called Solaris Universe, or a solar universe, something like that. There was a bunch of physicists, and they were talking about the the cycles of the, you know, the UBIS and how... At some point, and this was right before 12, 21, 12, they said it would align up with the galactic core, and then we would have a gigantic DMT activation ray coming from the, the solar sun out to the Earth, and it was going to reach us at such and such a date and time. It wasn't going to be 12, 21, 12, but it was going to be somewhere where the uh, this whole the solar system would become simultaneously conscious. So there was this, that's just one point. And I'm just uh, 
curious how this all aligns with like the biblical tale of the ascension and part, uh, you know, the, the judgment and the part will go to the light and part will go to the dark and some will go to heaven and some will go to hell and there'll be a new earth and an old earth and they're raptured and ah, da, da, da. I know there's some kind of, you know, things get put into religious context and fables and myths and then we have physicists and they're they're talking about the new age stuff but there's some accuracy in everything and there's some you know uh warping in in everything what are your thoughts on all these different concepts about the ascension process what is the ascension are we ascending will we ascend is that just the end of another cycle the yugas who <laughs> oh, you know yeah so we're kind of getting out towards the end of the gangplank here and we're taking a saw and uh-huh. sawing it off but uh, <laughs> uh, you know I look at everything do, you, and I just go wow you know look at that right. so, yeah. yeah you know and so I love science because we can talk in terms and you can look up things and check it out and we can all come to agreement because it's just it's a language you know that people can agree on and uh, religion is too, but it's a language we have a difficult time agreeing on. And uh, and so because it's broken into, you know, so many sort of fundamental viewpoints. But there, you know, there's a an old religion, Sanatana Dharma. It it's, I mean, the eternal truth, supposedly the essence of of all religions. And that should agree with uh, what science is but I don't know that we're to the point of, of really understanding that but but when I the few books I've read on on that you know like Autobiography of the Yogi by Parmand mm-hmm. Yogananda for example um, clearly they, they talk about the individual evolving uh, just as scientists would say that our outer solar system would evolve or a species would evolve that the individual, you know, through various lifetimes would uh, ascend to a higher and higher consciousness. And it seems pretty logical to me because, uh, you know, everything seems to be moving that direction in an up cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and, so, and I'm not going to disagree with evolution. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I think it happens on an individual basis as well as a, as a planetary basis but I, I don't know how to talk about it in terms of uh, ascension and stuff, just because I, I don't know that language. Okay. Right. Okay. People symbol and language things, and uh, as a therapist and a counselor, and you know, and a researcher, I learned to. And my husband's an anthropologist. We you meet people in their symbol system. And sometimes you realize they're talking about the same thing. My husband is story, but he was a young anthropologist in, in the. Um, in the South Pacific, and he was studying uh, the, the languages, learning the Tongan or something, and they had this elaborate story, and he wrote it all down, and he, he went week after week and studied it, and to his professor, he says, oh, that's Joseph Smith and how he came across the You know, and it's like it, the different stories get twisted depending on what culture is interpreting it, right? And so it was sort of yeah. I'm not saying it right, but he you know, he thought he made this new discovery of this whole story of the of how this uh Tongan culture was established and and the professor and my husband was raised um Jewish, right? So he had no understanding of the the Mormon story. And this is back in the sixties, right? So it's not it's not the same world that we have now. So he was just so excited because I discovered something and oh no, no, that's Joseph Smith coming across the, the West and settling and they put it into um, you know, their dance, their tongue and dance. And, you know, there was all these movements to it and it was like you know, it's just so funny. So it's the, the cargo that cult. You never know what what a culture's gonna how they're gonna interpret it. Um and it's the same story, but it just got twisted through their own uh, simple system. So I'm I'm gonna let yeah, Karen yeah, have a could, could be. <laughs> yeah. You know there's a, a, a wonderful book, I, I mentioned it uh briefly and that's called Hamlet's Mill. And I the main author of course was Giorgio de Santiana, who I mentioned uh from MIT, he also taught at Harvard for a while, so a real good scholar. But his co author um is Hertha von Deschen and she uh is from Gerda University, Frankfurt, 
and you know just an equally brilliant scholar and she's got this uh, funny section it's it's in the introduction uh, to Hamlet's Mill where she says that she's she's an anthropologist and so she's been studying the world's mess and trying to figure out kind of what they mean and she's been working for a year on Polynesian myths and she's read 10,000 pages and it finally <laughs> dawns on her that she hasn't understood a single sentence, not a single sentence over a year and 10,000 pages. And so she, she's exhausted and, and upset and she wants to try to find another key. And um, her mind turns to astronomy, but she, she's fearful of astronomy. You know, it's complex. You got to figure out how planets move and, and star systems move and things like that. And uh, so she hesitates to go there. And then finally um, she reads about a new archeological discovery and it's right on um, uh, the Tropic of, of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. I can't remember which, which one. Uh, it's one of the, one of the island northernmost uh, Hawaiian islands, I believe. A- anyway, uh, where there's a hinge there, and so there obviously it's an old culture that's doing something related to uh, you know the the stars, the heavens, a greater space uh, with their alignments and things. And so, sure enough, she realizes that astronomy is the key to understanding many of these stories. And and that's how they uh, discover that uh, many of these ancient cultures are talking of procession and, mm. and this much greater cycle of time. So it's a beautiful story. Hamlet's Mill, I strongly recommend I'm looking it. at it now. Uh, they have it actually online if you want to just, at least there's Google Hamlet's Mill and it opens up to the different chapters and you can just read it right there. Yeah, fascinating. Looking at Gilgamesh and Prometheus. Yeah. That's your last yeah. chapter. Yeah. And it's really well researched and, and great footnotes in there. So if if one is really interested in the meaning of the word Nibiru, uh, you can go to the footnotes and see the how the various uh German scientists uh you know, interpret the etymology of, of the word and uh they're really uh, you know, I think I think they nail it. So it's good stuff. That's in the appendix. Yes. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. I've, I I can't remember which appendix is there, but if you yeah, if you have it online, yeah, you can probably there. search it. Right. Yeah. I think I can search it. Interesting. Back to you, Karen. Well, we've got a lot of things that you're saying as you're going along here. Now I have to go chase down that hinge that you're talking about because that's of interest <laughs> in my earth anomaly group. So, yeah, I, I, I ran across Hamlet's Mill once before just, just making some notes on something I was studying, and I kind of in the back of my mind said, this is pretty good. I need to come back to that. So I'm going to come back and chase down that hinge and find it because this is the kind of thing we like to talk about, hinges, pyramids, um, you know, Adam's calendar in South Africa, all these uh, stone works, megalithic stone works that are, have all these alignments to, to star patterns. And uh, it, fortunately, when I was an astronomy buff as a young kid, we were also doing a lot of camping out in the Northwest. And uh, that's one thing I kind of realized on those camping nights is that um, the night sky was early man's movie theater <laughs> television. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. They they were really watching a lot of things going on. It was something that they would make a note of these changes, the the planets, the movements of the planets, the constellations that came up at the different seasons. Um, So, you know, um, and then also these really ancient texts going into so so much detail. You kind of wonder if they got in a a spaceship and flew around and kind of knew what was going on up in the sky. But uh, something that came to my mind as we've been talking, as we were talking about the language of science and the language of of religion, was the fact that uh, something that has come up in my anomaly group is um, pretty vociferous, heated debates about, you know, what is science, what isn't. I have to remind some of the people that we are uh, an anomaly group, so we're interested in the weird stuff. Um, Because some people, you know, will just kind of be in a denial or skeptic 
uh, and that's great. Go go make your own group, you know. <laughs> that's fine. Or or make a valid, you know, make a valid argument that we should consider. Or you know, let us know if it really is a hoax and give us a reference. That's great. But science is one of those things where um, it does have these disparate belief systems and dominant belief systems. And uh, you know, it's interesting. We're just now confirming something that Einstein postulated. So you have to have incredible, have to have incredible multi generational, um, you know, patience <laughs> with the process and astronomy and some of these sciences. So you know, um, this is where people kind of think of science as this monolithic uh, structure of truth and fact. And it's always really kind of evolving as we get new information. And uh, I know if you're going to contact in the desert and the speaker and these other things, you're you're kind of running into those fringe areas. And what do you think about that philosophically? How do you work with that? Well, you're right. It it is always evolving. And um, and it's because our, our consciousness is changing. So the things we see, we look at differently. And that's one beautiful thing about the um, about the yugas, uh, you know. And I love kind of the way the the Greeks talk about it. So the Iron Age is the age of man, and one has no greater awareness than the things he can touch and feel and and see, and uh, so he's not aware of any finer forces or or are small objects. So he's not aware of electricity or magnetism or um, molecules or atoms or anything like this. You know, it's just a very material universe in, in sort of the lowest age. And so you interpret uh, facts differently and you come up with uh, this sort of really basic uh, science. And, and when you come into things that you can't explain, like, you know, magnetism uh, and electromagnetic effects and things like this, you call it, you know, uh, witchcraft or or voodoo or something like that, because you don't have a scientific basis for it. But then, as you you know, you evolve and you get into the next uh, age, like we are now, which the Greeks would call um, the age of the hero or the Bronze Age. Uh, according to the Indian uh, descriptions of this, man becomes aware of uh, finer forces. He becomes aware of uh, small things. And, you know, you usher in this area and you not only have a knowledge of electricity and magnetism, but also Einstein comes along and there's atomic energy and, and now there's, you know, quantum physics and you realize things get, uh, very strange that there's a whole world on which the physical world uh, rests that's uh, th- that we're just beginning to understand. And then supposedly the age after this, the Greeks called the silver age, the uh, age of the demigods, which Hollywood portrays as God marrying a man. But uh, what the, I think the ancients meant was, you know, man's becoming, oh, aware that he is a God, you know, that some, something much, much greater than just a physical body. And then according to the Indians, you know, that's the, uh, the time when telepathy, they say once again becomes common knowledge, you know, a pre babble era before the tongues are confused. Uh, and so uh, it, it's interesting that if you find any validity to the, the yugas, that it will indeed help you explain why science looks at things differently in different epochs of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, it makes sense. One thing I thought about the Internet is the Internet is a weird kind of telepathy because we now, um, one of the teachers that I had talked about um, that we have, uh, well, kind of leading into what, um, the morphogenetic field concept where we have a shared mind or a biokind bio mind. And uh, I think we're on an ascension process in the fact that, you know, we just look back in history, the brutality, and we probably got in our most volatile during the years we were kind of having a very large scale war with very large, scary weapons. And then with this um, internet, you know, as a, cause I, I came into that, that was my profession 
um, I came into it with looking at information systems and how, like, it gets a little bit harder to think of just bombing somewhere on a map over there when you can literally talk to the people over there. Um, this week I've been following the, the big fires up in um, in uh, Canada, and it's just grippingly right there, people just pointing their fo- phone cameras at these flames leaping right beside the highway. I mean, we're we're becoming aware of other people, other cultures, and uh, it gets a little bit harder to be so, um, you know, xenophobic, so to speak. Plus, for researchers, um, it's a boon because they used to have to go to the library and try to find each other's articles and all that stuff and made real good use of the card catalog, you know, <laughs> to find uh, to to get ancillary information for their theories and their research. Now it's in your back pocket. You just Google <laughs> the thing, you know, or you go into a repository of uh, papers in, written in academia. I mean, to me, that seems like a, a knowledge, like a knowledge precursor to where we, we kind of go back to a knowing where we're connected to the inter- information field. We recognize that connection and begin to cultivate it. So I think uh, the silver age is visible from here. <laughs> I think. I, you know, I, I love your thinking. Uh, so, yeah, if you look at the, the yugas and the way they describe the, you know, the age we're in, the electrical age, the atomic age, um, you know, we we master uh, the use of energy and electrons and things like that. And uh, you you hear that, and if you don't think about it, you say, ah, I don't know about that. But, yeah, if you understand. All right, who's calling? <laughs> oh, um, somebody's phone lunch. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, but there's a phone ringing somewhere. Okay, okay. I'm sorry about on. that. I think I, I was getting an incoming call. You're but anyway, oh, okay. yeah, it's, it's it's cool that we can use uh, <laughs> electrons and we move them in just massive quantities so quickly around the planet, and oh, you yeah. can and create images with them and and it's just and stories with them and it's yeah it's it's like uh, it would have to a farmer 200 years ago it would just seem like magic or witchcraft, wouldn't it? Oh, oh certainly. I just want to give everybody a heads up. We're on the last couple minutes, and I want to, Walter for you to get a chance to tell everybody about what you're talking about at the Contact in the Desert conference, and uh, how can people reach you, your website, and stuff like that. Yes, uh, so I, I will be appearing at that Contact in the Desert um, conference. It looks really fun, and uh, it's at jo- in Joshua Tree. I believe it's June 3rd to 6th. Um, and I'll be speaking on uh, some of the forces that uh, are tugging on our solar system and have a presentation on on some of the science behind it and a couple of different hypotheses. Um, and my website is uh, binaryresearchinstitute.org. Uh, and you can see some of our papers and and uh, and hypotheses uh, right there too, if you wish. And then we have a big conference coming up uh, towards the end of the year too, called the conference on procession and ancient knowledge, which gets ties this whole thing much more to uh, ancient archeological anthropological discoveries. Where's that at? That's uh, also in the desert, but it's in Rancho Mirage, California. And that uh, website is Mirage. It's uh, it's not too Park. far from Palm Springs. It's okay. a really beautiful spot though, and great hikes. And we do stargazing. The stars are very bright out there, and uh, we awesome. have some mythologists speaking, and uh, archaeologists, and Egyptologists. Uh, Dr. Robert Schock, uh, you know, geologist, and so it'll be fun. And that one's CPAC oh. online, C-P-A-K online dot com. Well, thank you. That's awesome. And uh, Karen, 
I don't know where you put the commercial <laughs> on the back there. Oh, no, but I'll, in case you don't get it up and running, it's, uh, I was doing the commercial today. It's contactinthedesert.com, and it lists all the speakers and every all the information you need to know about that event, and it sounds awesome. Yeah. I, w- I, I, I wish I could go. <laughs> I'll buy the kids in my beer, but yeah, great. Oh, I have to. Awesome. Hopefully yeah. you, can, you can go. Send Karen money. She wants to go. <laughs> yes, I um, do. Yeah, so we're we're going. Dr. Lesson, uh, Dr. Lesson couldn't be here today, but Walter, uh, Dr. Lesson, I was going to say hi. Recording radio, I'm sure we'll have at least two minutes to look at each other and shake hands. Uh, but thank you Sounds so great. much, everybody, for coming today. Uh, my apologies to contact the desert. They can't play the commercial, but Karen made a commercial. We'll have it up for the next show. And um, any final words, to, final round for the three of you? Any final words to our listeners? No, I look forward to seeing everybody at Contact in the Desert or the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. Um, uh, and keep reading the Space News. It's fun. Take care. Okay, we will do. Karen, any okay. final words? Yeah, I, I, I signed up for your newsletter. I just decided I was really enjoying looking at it. And you guys should go check out uh, uh, this information. It's it's really intriguing and scientifically uh, stimulating. So thank you for coming. Okay. And that's it from Janet Care Lesson, Karen, Christine, Patrick, and Walter Crittenden on uh, Aquarian Radio. Love and blessings and aloha. Aloha. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody. Come on, music, play. <laughs> All righty. Well, the music's not playing, so I'm just going to end it. Thank you much. Love and blessings. Aloha. Have you heard? Metro by T-Mobile now includes Amazon Prime. Yes, enjoy the best of shopping and entertainment, movies, TV shows, music, free shipping, and much more. All included for just $40 per line for three lines. All on the T-Mobile network. Discover the smarter way. Metro by T-Mobile. That's genius. One offer per account. Offer subject to change. Twelve ninety nine per month value. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Metro customers may notice reduced speeds versus some T-Mobile customers. Video at 480p. Capable device required. See store for details and terms and conditions.